In this episode, we're talking to Dr. Michael Ruscio on how to optimize your gut health. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today we're gonna be talking all about gut health and how that relates to your health and energy levels more broadly and a whole bunch of unique connections between the gut and different systems of the body and lots of new content that you almost certainly have not heard before. Today, my guest is Dr. Michael Ruscio, who is a doctor of chiropractic, a clinical researcher, and best-selling author whose practical ideas on healing chronic illness have made him an influential voice in functional and alternative medicine. His research has been published in peer-reviewed medical journals, and he speaks at integrated medical conferences across the globe, and he's also the new author, or he's the author of the new book, I should say, Healthy Gut, Healthy You. So welcome, Dr. Michael Ruscio. Such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, to get started, I would love for you to just talk a bit about your background of how you got into this this space of, of, I guess, health more broadly, but then specifically what made you focus on going deep on gut health. Sure, sure. Well, I had my own experience with this in college, and, and this was when I was pre-med and still trying to figure out exactly how I wanted to plug into the health medical system. Um, originally, I was thinking about going into conventional medicine. Well, I, I, was, I was pretty much set on going into conventional medicine. It appealed to kind of my, my type A analytical you know, mind, but as, as oftentimes happens, I had a few life experiences thrown my way, and they kind of diverted my path or, or helped me become more granular in exactly what I wanted to do. And I didn't know what was happening at the time, but I started having insomnia, brain fog, fatigue, um, bouts of depression. And I, I really was at a loss for why, as a college athlete, someone who was feeling near invincible up until that point, I was uh, you know, very suddenly starting to feel unwell. And I was getting enough sleep, I was eating a all whole foods, mostly organic diet, exercising. I mean, I was studying this stuff, so I knew how to take care of myself. Yet, despite all my best efforts, I was still feeling quite ill at this point in time. And so I, I figured, well, I'll go see a few doctors. This is what they do, and this is what I'm going to be doing. And, and so let me, I guess, get a firsthand experience with this. And I saw a internist, a endocrinologist, and a general practitioner, and they ran some tests and essentially the narrative I got in return was, well, you know, you're the picture of health. Everything looks good. All of our tests are fine. It must be stress. It must be school, what have you. Um, and there was really nothing that I was offered in terms of a diagnosis or a solution. And, and so like many people do at that point in time, I turned to alternative medicine and I found a doctor who thought I may have had an intestinal parasite. And I remember thinking to myself, this, this guy is nuts. You know, I, I hadn't left the country. I have never had food poisoning. I had no digestive symptoms. How could I have a parasite? And, you know, that, that taught me a very important lesson, which is you can have a, a digestive problem that only manifests as non-digestive symptoms. And so lo and behold, uh, a few months later, I figured out that I, in fact, did have an intestinal parasite that was causing all this gut inflammation, but... but um, wasn't wasn't causing any gut symptoms so no bloating no gas no diarrhea no abdominal pain only brain fog insomnia fatigue i was also feeling cold um, but before i before i got that diagnosis i went on the internet and i researched and i thought i had adrenal fatigue i thought i had hypothyroidism or poor thyroid conversion i thought i had heavy metal toxins and so i did all the self-help protocols for these you know um, purported diagnoses and didn't really feel any better it wasn't until I actually figured out that I had a parasite and, and treated that problem in my gut that I started to respond. And, and so I decided to go into integrative and alternative medicine. And when I got there, I, I liked a lot of what I saw, but I also felt like there was a fair amount of dogma. And, and there was some beliefs that were very rigid, but didn't seem to have any science to support them. And when I wanted to have an honest inquisition or I just, just an honest inquiry about well, does everyone need to go gluten-free? You know, is there really evidence to support that? And I'd get these, oh, they, they had these really strong answers, yet there wasn't really good data in my mind to support those things. But, you know, I was a student, and so you're, 
sometimes you're not confident enough to take on your professor when you're a student, but that, that seed was in my head. And, and as I got into clinical practice, I, I felt like there was, again, a lot of great things in alternative medicine, but a lot of things that I felt like were half truths and potentially a lot of fat that could be excised from the model. And so, you know, this led me to performing some of my own research, some of which we've done at the clinic, some of which is on its way to publication and, and other studies are in, in the pipeline, trying to find this right balance of what to use from, from natural and integrative medicine, and then what might be dogma that needs to be left by the wayside as we update this model. And the, the gut therapies are the ones that I've consistently noticed, albeit I, I may be a bit biased, but consistently noticed deliver the most improvements for the patient. And that's why my focus is there. And that's why I you know, kind of have this somewhat critical view of things in healthcare and medicine, because I've just seen there are a lot of things that are well-intentioned, but not supported. And if we can identify those things, we can make our model of care more effective. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, we also have a lot in common on one particular point, which is um, I'm not particularly liked by either people within <laughs> just purely conventional medicine circles or alternative medicine circles because I'm in this sort of weird um, no man's land in between those two sure. where I'm, you know, kind of pointing out flaws within conventional medicine approaches to lots of different chronic medical conditions as far as the lack of, of education and focus on nutrition and lifestyle factors, which are just, of course, massive in almost all chronic conditions. Uh, and then on the other hand, as, as you were alluding to within alternative medic medical circles, there's a lot of dogma and a lot of belief systems that aren't necessarily supported by very good evidence. And so I'm, I'm also like simultaneously saying, you know, kind of debunking certain things within alternative medicine communities. And so it sounds like you are also kind of in this no man's land with me. Yes, and I, I like to think the population in no man's land is growing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like to think that as, as information is becoming so easily accessible, um, people are no longer falling for kind of the argument from authority. And that authority could be the conventional authority. It could be the alternative authority. But I think people are starting to look for factual support rather than expert-driven opinions. And, and, and I, I, I like to think that there was this pendulum swing toward you know, dogmatic, progressive views, both in conventional and alternative medicine, but people are getting burnt out on those dogmatic views. And, and unfortunately, it, it used to be whoever kind of yelled the loudest got the most attention, but I think that's been burnt out, kind of like a, a marketing campaign in a city. If you're the first guy to put up a flashing neon sign, you're gonna get some attention, but then eventually there's gonna be so many flashing neon signs that people just tune them out completely and they're looking for maybe the, the quaint little shop that doesn't seem to be so in your face sales. And I think, I hope that's what's happening in healthcare, health and fitness and medicine where people are looking for more of a nuanced um, you know, uh, um, opinion and, and not people that are so hard driving. And, and you know, there, there's a quote I, I like to share, which is, dogmatism can only survive in the presence of ignorance. And so in my opinion, someone can only be really hard driving on their views if they're unaware of the contradictory evidence. Because once you are aware of the contradictory evidence to a given point, you, you have a more balanced view. Well, it, it could be this, but there's also some data to support that. So you have a softer narrative. And, and so I think people are getting hip to the fact, or privy to the fact that people who give you these really, you know, staunch, hard-lined recommendations, unfortunately, are oftentimes ignorant to the contradictory data and therefore giving you advice that's not really well-crafted and well-developed. Well said. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. So the gut specifically, it's not really a new idea that the gut is very important to health. Uh, it's been around since the time of Hippocrates, obviously, uh, thousands of years ago. Um, but right now it's kind of exploding in popularity, this idea that the gut, the microbiome are extremely important in, in our health. Uh, there's even you know, very big companies that are, are emerging in this space with biome and ubiome. Um, I hope to, to talk about that during this interview with you. But um, why, do you, wh why did you feel compelled to write a book on this subject? You know, as, as there's so many people talking about gut health, what made you want to say, I also want to be one of these people talking about gut health, but I want to do it in, a, in, a, in, in my way? What, what, what was the motivating factor behind that? So the, the book initially started as an ebook where, where I just wanted to give people some advice, 
right some wrongs and try to give people a reasonable narrative. And part of the reason I, I had that objective was because I was seeing patients come into the clinic and they were, some were, were just decimated by fear of food, right? And they went and they read about how gluten is bad, then about how carbs are bad, then about how dairy is bad, then about how FODMAPs are bad, then about how high sulfur is bad, and well, histamine is good. And they come in and they're just crippled by fear. They don't know what to eat and they've totally forgotten how to just listen to the simple signals that your body throws you as a way of your body telling you what's working. So part of it, part of it was that. Um, part of it was also just seeing how other providers were overly reliant on tests and not realizing that a surprising number of tests have actually not been clinically validated. And so you know, what that means is that the real literal translation of that is what you're looking at has zero meaning. So even though it says high or low or bad or it's in red or, or what have you, that doesn't actually mean anything. So it is possible for a lab to tell you something is wrong with you, but that hasn't actually been validated to mean anything is wrong with you. And this, this is a really unfortunate state of affairs where I think the consumer's trust and the clinician's trust has been violated. But I was seeing a number of patients who went to a doctor, had stool testing of some sort done, and the stool tests were treated at the exclusion of the patient's history, their symptomatic context, and their response to treatments. And the failure point was there. And these patients would come into my office and it wasn't hard to get them well. All you had to do was look at lab testing as one fraction of a multi-component system, their history, their signs, their symptoms, or presentation, their response to previous treatments, their response to current treatments, and use all this to understand the individual and therefore what the individual needs. Uh, and once you do that, you're able to get good results. It turns out that there was more than 60 pages that was required to achieve that end, um, which I originally thought an ebook would be maybe 60 pages. My book ended up being about 334 pages with just under a thousand medical references supporting the approach. Um, so I, I wanted to give people a full guide for understanding your gut. What are the relevant players? What is a, a reasonable understanding and what steps you can take to improve your health? Um, and I, I guess the one other thing, you know, one of the other major items was I wanted to give people a, a well-rounded kind of all-encompassing approach. So you kind of had a, a, um, a quarterback perspective, meaning this isn't going to be the book all about gluten or all about FODMAPs or all about probiotics or all about low carb or all about high carb and just give you what could be a very helpful um, treatment plan, but that's tunnel vision into this one therapeutic avenue, but rather lay out the broad array of therapeutic tools that are available and help you determine which ones are best for you and then help codify those to a sequence of steps that can help you figure out the optimum number of stimuli to present in your gut to allow healing. Um, and of course, you know, when you say it like that, I suppose it's easy to understand that that wouldn't really be an ebook. That would be, you know, a, a little bit more of a robust read. Um, but those are some of the main motivators for me to, to publish the book. Excellent. One thing I want to dig into a little bit that you, that you mentioned there is the fact that a lot of the tests uh, that are being used commonly, in, including in functional medicine circles, are not clinically or scientifically validated. Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of this going on in functional medicine circles. Uh, and it's, it's very deceptive, in my opinion, because you, you have people will go and do these tests and they think, oh, if it's a test, it must mean that it's been scientifically validated. It's, it's really scientifically advanced, cutting edge, technologically advanced, all these things. And it's, it's so much more advanced than not doing testing. Right. Um, right. And, and yet, you know, when you get down to it, you find out that a lot of these labs that are doing these tests are themselves businesses that are creating tests for the purpose of making money. And, and you know, Basically, what ends up happening is people do these tests, they think that they're science, that they're backed by science. And as you said, a lot of these tests just are meaningless. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very well said. And, and, and one of the things that I try to cover in the um, clinical newsletter that, that we write for clinicians as, as a training tool for clinicians, one of the philosophies is that more testing and treatment does not equate to better results. And it's, it's been a fictitious promise 
that we've been sold in, especially in functional medicine. And I don't think any of this is done with malintent. I think most people are operating with good intentions, although there's been a couple of labs that litigation has been brought against and they've pled guilty to essentially fraudulent. So it's not to say we can, we can look at the world through rose colored glasses. Uh, you know, there, there is some, some culpability um, from I think a small number of, of labs that, that have really been malicious, but for the most part, I think the labs, the supplement companies and the providers are all trying to do the best they can for people. It's just there's some errors in how we're thinking and how we're processing information that allow erroneous conclusions to be drawn and then those are propagated and then you know years and years later you have a field that is performing way too much testing, way too much treatment and we've gotten away from some of the roots that actually come back to conventional medicine's evidence-based um, you know, hierarchy uh, and, and I think what's happened is, and I talk about this in my book, I call it the freedom effect, where for so long we were, we were shackled by the confines of, of kind of a conventional healthcare system. And when, when we finally got a chance to depart from that and have more freedom, we didn't know how, how to really use that freedom or be responsible with that freedom. And the analogy I use in the book is you have a teenager who maybe went to a Catholic school and was really kind of isolated their whole life. Then they go to college where they can drink and smoke and do drugs and they don't know how to balance it and they just go off the rails because they don't know how to you know, responsibly handle that freedom. And that may sound like a, a flippant analogy, but um, it's one of the ways I try to account for the fact that some of these tests, uh, like, like these microbiota mapping tests that you mentioned earlier, while they do have their purpose, and that purpose is to amass data so that we can eventually get to a clinical prescriptive predictive ability of these tests, we are not there right now. And so if you're someone who's suffering and you're going to put a few hundred dollars into one of those tests, thinking that those tests provide the answer, they, they do not. And it, it's really unfortunate, with the exception of two labs, one called day two that predicts glycemic response to foods, and the other called the GA map, not to be confused with the GI map, which is available in the United States. The GA map is being pioneered by a group out in Norway. Um, and that test is only just showing correlations, meaning this profile correlates to IBS or to IBD. They still haven't gotten to the point where they can say, we know what to do in terms of how to treat these findings. So the best data that we have, one test shows the ability to predict your glycemic response to foods, and there may be some utility there, I'm certainly open to that. And the other is able to accurately show correlations between IBS and IBD and certain mappings of the microbiota, but treatment still, still cannot be rendered. And it's, it's, it's crucially important that we're clear on that because I, I see so many patients now who come in and say, oh, I've gotten a X, Y, or Z test and I, I shrug my shoulders and say, well, no, that's great, but we can't really do anything with that. And, and I should just quickly mention that it's not to say that you can't feel better. There is a tremendous wealth of therapeutic options available to you. It's just what we don't want to do is get distracted into treating what I call meaningless measures on non-validated tests, because that will give you the highest probability that's tr that the treatment that you do will not help you improve. And we want to focus on trying to identify what treatment do you present most likely to respond to and steer you toward those treatments? And, and ironically, for many cases of digestive imbalance, whether they be IBS or, or similar, a lot of testing isn't really required to make those adjudications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Um, one point I want to emphasize here, because I encounter this a lot with these GI mapping companies that, that, are, that are now emerging and becoming very popular, a lot of people are doing these tests. A lot of members of my community are going out and doing these tests with the, the impression they're under the belief. And it's, it's not, um, it's not unreasonable that they're under this belief because these companies I think are promoting, they, they want people to believe this. Right. Um, they, they, they do these tests and they think, well, I got my GI, my microbiome mapped. And you know, now they're, you know, the, now that it's mapped, what's the best diet for me? You know, now that, now that we know what my microbiome is, as if it's this sort of static thing, now I know the best bio-individualized diet based on my unique microbiome. And again, it sounds like scientific and really advanced. And I just want to point out to people that, as, as you're saying, 
this is in, in its infancy, and we are very far from a stage that, that we can like map somebody's microbiome and say, here, based on this data, here's the, the one best diet for you. You should be vegan, or you should be keto, or whatever. In fact, we have very good data. I think the, perhaps the best, arguably the best, study that looked at this was known as the Diet Fit Trial by Gardner et al. over at Stanford. And they essentially took some, some gene markers to try to predict what person would respond best to what type of diet. Would it be a higher carb or a lower carb diet? So uh, genes a little bit different than microbiota mapping, but essentially, you know, one of the best analyses we have to look at this found that genetic testing to predict who would respond better to a higher carb or lower carb diet found essentially no correlation. Yeah. And the, you know, so the, the point I'm making is, and, and, and in your making is, just because we have information doesn't mean that information can help you inform decision making any better than you would otherwise. In fact, if that data can't inform your decision making any better, but it's causing you not to listen to your body's own response, it will in effect make you less effective in figuring out what works well for your body. And I, I, and I also talk about this in the book. There's a couple different dietary maneuvers one can make to figure out what diet fits best for the microbiota. And it takes you about two to three weeks each diet to figure it out. So by the time you did a test and got the results back, you could be halfway there or even all the way there if you happen to do the first diet uh, the, or the first diet that you did was the best one for you to figure out which, what works well for your gut. Sans the three, four, five, six, seven hundred dollar bill that you would, uh, you know, um, uh, test for, or, or, or the testing would cost you. And I saw also mentioned on top of that, you know, there are things that we know exists or exist that can't be readily tested. Small intestinal fungal overgrowth is one example of this. Now we know about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. That's fairly easily to test. We also know that small intestinal fungal overgrowth may affect this same subset of patients who have digestive symptoms, yet we can't test for it routinely. The only way to test for it is really to do an endoscopy and take a biopsy of fluid in the small intestine, which is very invasive and therefore it's, it's hardly ever done. So someone could do a SIBO test, come back positive for SIBO, and then craft their entire worldview, their entire treatment plan around the fact that they have SIBO. Yet, they're missing the fact that perhaps they have small intestinal fungal overgrowth, and perhaps they're also hypersensitive to gas pressure. And, and so they're making all these decisions based upon one slice, or you can think of it like maybe one eighth of data relevant to their gut. And, and so this is why, unfortunately, I see so many people who are following the, the, the dictums of, of, of the diagnosis that they have, but they're not listening to their body. And it's just really quick here, one patient had SIBO in, in my clinic. She also had some problems with blood sugar regulation. And she asked me, oh, Dr. Rusha, will I ever be able to eat fruit again? And I said, well, you know, why, why can't you eat fruit? She said, well, I have SIBO. And I said, oh, okay. It is, so is there something regarding fruit and SIBO I'm unaware of? She goes, well, I've read that if you have SIBO, you, you really shouldn't have fruit. You can never really have fruit. It'll, it'll feed the SIBO. And I said, okay. So, and I chose not to get into that. And I said, how do you feel when you eat fruit? She goes, oh, I feel fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and, and these things happen more often than, than you might think. Um, so again, I don't want to be overly critical on testing, but um, it's, it's important to not use testing that hasn't been validated at the expense of listening to your body. Because you'd be amazed at how far you can get with kind of running through a well-crafted algorithm for your gut health, listening to your response, and then using your response to inform what you should do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've kind of gone specific down this, this particular path. I want to go broad real quick and, and just assume that some people listening don't necessarily already have a lot of familiarity with gut health and, and how it relates to overall health or, or energy levels. Um, there's obviously a lot of research here and I'm kind of tasking you with summing up this broad landscape in just a few sentences, but sure. you know, there's obviously research related to like chronic fatigue syndrome, showing gut permeability and lipopolysaccharide antibodies and, um, you know, things related to brain health and, you know, all sorts of different systems of the body. And the more, you know, as this goes on in the coming years, we're going to find, I'm sure, even way more links than we are currently aware of. Sure. Um, 
but can you kind of just talk about the broad landscape of why gut health is important? And, um, and then from there, maybe what are some of the biggest factors uh, or the biggest kinds of gut problems that are emerging in, in the world today? Sure. No, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, maybe a way to kind of provide a, a philosophical framework to help people navigate the, the end take home actionable and not get lost in the details that justify the actionable. I would say if you've taken some preliminary steps to improve your diet and your lifestyle and you're still not feeling well, the next thing I would consider is going through a process that helps to improve and optimize your gut health. And the reason I, I say that is because you can have a non-digestive symptom that is being solely driven by a digestive problem. So you could have joint pain and insomnia, and those are the only symptoms that you have. And the problem could be emanating from your gut, and, and the gut symptoms could be silent, right? So this is why I don't wanna frame it around well, you've got to have gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, reflux in order for this stuff to be relevant, right? So that's a really important piece that we need to slide into place, which is you could have non-digestive symptoms that are manifesting from a silent digestive problem. Therefore, look at this in terms of a, a hierarchy or a sequence. Now, what do we know? Well, we know, for example, that uh, as you alluded to earlier, Chronic fatigue syndrome has been shown in one study to respond to a low FODMAP diet. Those with IBS in another exciting uh, recent study have shown, to, so IBS is essentially gas, bloating, abdominal pain, and an and alteration in bowel frequency, either constipation, diarrhea, or an oscillation between the two. And IBS subjects were shown to have higher scores of fatigue, depression, and anxiety. So there's kind of your gut metabolism, gut brain connection. And there's also been, I believe, two meta-analyses, which are summaries of several clinical trials with probiotics, which is, of course, a, a gut treatment, shown the ability to be efficacious for anxiety and depression. There's also preliminary evidence showing that either treatment of H. pylori, which is a bacterium in the stomach, or a low FODMAP diet, you know, essentially a, a paleo-type low FODMAP diet, can improve thyroid autoimmunity and lower thyroid antibodies to a significant degree. Other research has, has, has found correlations between small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and thyroid autoimmunity, and also between small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and hypothyroidism. Other treatment data shows the ability to improve either rosacea, so skin, atopic dermatitis, or restless leg syndrome, or, um, yeah, okay, I got them all. Uh, um, or uh, all via different methods of gut treatment. So we see gut brain, we see gut thyroid, we see gut skin, we see gut joint. Uh, you know, it, it's it's really remarkable the the connections. Also, other preliminary evidence is showing a connection between metabolism, metabolism specifically, I'm meaning blood glucose and cholesterol levels, uh, and weight correlate to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and preliminary data show improvements in cholesterol and blood sugar. And I've seen anecdotally reductions in weight, sometimes marked reductions in weight, but not always um, after treating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And some preliminary evidence correlating, correlating not, show, not, not showing treatment outcome yet, but um, heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So there, there's a tremendous amount here, and it can be very hard to say, well, these specific symptoms mean that I should improve my gut health, which is why I come back to the, the sequence of first, cover the basics. Then, if you're not feeling well, and you're thinking, is it thyroid, is it heavy metals, is it uh, toxins, is it lime, is it mold? The next thing I would recommend you do is look into optimizing your gut health. Excellent. So... What are, what are the specific conditions? I know, I know you've obviously mentioned a couple of them in passing or a few of them in passing here, but what are, what are, can you just kind of list off some of the most common gut problems that exist today? Sure. Well, you can, we can think of these in, in, in constellations of symptoms that are labeled as conditions, or we can think of them as symptoms. And I'll, I'll kind of tackle this you know, from both ends. And then, I, and then I, I do want to get back to the other part of your question, which is what are some of the more effective treatments that people can get started with in optimizing their gut health? Um, but we have IBS, and IBS is oftentimes encapsulated by abdominal pain, 
bloating, and then altered bowel function. So this could be diarrhea, constipation, or an oscillation between the two. Now, there's also what's known as dyspepsia or indigestion, and this may involve stomach or a kind of sternal area, epigastric discomfort, burning, um, or, or belching or reflux. There's also inflammatory bowel disease. The two most common subsets are your ulcerative colitis and your Crohn's, although there are other subsets. And the symptoms here have a lot of overlap with IBS, but the underlying um, cause is, is different. And so in inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD or ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, you oftentimes have a, a diarrheal presentation. Diarrhea is, is much, much more common than the small subset that came out of constipation. So we have diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, sometimes as many as 12 bowel movements a day. And they may not all be diarrhea, they may just be you know, frequent loose bowels. There may be urgent bowel, and there also may be abdominal pain. Um, but we also know that uh, IBD can also manifest you know, as, as skin conditions also. And there, especially with Crohn's disease, there are some skin conditions that can manifest uh, as part of this. Uh, and then you also have things like gastritis and ulcers, which are irritation for the lining of the stomach. Um, and this is where I think oftentimes, especially with, with gastritis and ulcers, natural medicine actually disservice, does a disservice to people because natural medicine is, is so gung-ho to give supplemental acid, betaine, HCL. Um, yet, oftentimes I find that those conditions do not need any more acid. And in fact, there's something going on in one's body immunologically that is causing a high level of acid. And I know that's considered blasphemous in natural medicine, but it's really what the, the data show if you look at it objectively. Um, so those are just uh, you know, a few of the more common things that people may be grappling with from a digestive perspective. But don't forget that you could have active inflammation and damage in your gut that's only manifesting in your joints, in your brain, in your skin, and what have you. Excellent. Um, I wanna digress on one point if you don't mind, uh, there's, there's a point of contention around SIBO. Um, one of my good friends, Dr. Alan Christensen, has written a long article, which I know you've read, that uh, basically is, is his attempt at debunking the whole concept of SIBO as a legitimate condition. And there's a lot of layers to this and, and uh, kind of how he's analyzed the evidence around, you know, you know, is it the, the studies testing, is there really too many bacteria in the small intestine? Uh, the hydrogen breath tests comparing, you know, normal healthy people without gut sim symptoms versus those with IBS symptoms and most studies failing to differentiate based on the, uh, the amount of hydrogen gas. And there's a number of other layers to this. But uh, I know, obviously, as you mentioned, you, you still uh, believe in, in SIBO. So what, what is your general take on that situation? Yes, yeah, it's a great question. You know, I don't, I don't think we need to get into a debate of does SIBO exist or does it not exist. I, I think, you know, what we should do is look at the totality of, of evidence and then look where the data points and, and always be open to updating our opinion. Um, and when you do that, you know, it's, it's fairly clear that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is a legitimate condition. Uh, you know, are there areas that need to be updated? I, I do think so. And I do think Christensen made a few valid criticisms in his article, uh, and mainly these stem around this kind of SIBO monoculture that seems to be budding, where you know, people are just obsessed with SIBO at the exclusion and expense of anything else in the gut. And also they're in this, you know, same mental framework, there does seem to be a lot of unnecessary fear. And, and I don't think any of that is intentionally propagated. I, I think it's just you have um, people who uh, write and, and uh, speak on SIBO, and, and sometimes we forget that we have to contextualize data points so as to not allow the consumer to run to the worst possible interpretation of those data points. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think there's, there's certainly enough evidence to show that SIBO is a condition. This is likely why the arguably two largest bodies in gastroenterology in the entire world, the Rome Foundation and, and the North American Expert Consensus, have both essentially issued guidelines for how to test SIBO and when to test SIBO and, and how to treat it. Now, that falls, those, those two major bodies' opinions do fall counter to much of what the SIBO community recommends. The SIBO community is probably a, a bit overzealous relative to that. Um, and there are some imperfections with the testing. 
you know, yes. Um, but it's, it's one thing to say, here's something that is helpful, but it's not perfect. And there are some areas that need to be rectified. It's another thing to say, because of those few areas that need to be rectified, we're going to throw the entire baby out with the bathwater. Um, so, you know, there, I mean, there's, there's so much that we can, we can go into here. SIBO breath testing has been shown to be uh, validated, at, at least the concept of showing dysbiosis, whether that bacterial dysbiosis is the exact pattern of small intestinal bacterial growth. I don't think we can fully say that from the data because there's, there's been some changes in the interpretation criteria for how you diagnose SIBO. So I believe this is why the one meta-analysis commenting on this, again, very high level scientific data, did show that this, there, there, there's, there's a small intestinal, uh, or, or there, there's a dysbiosis that's more common and that may be elucidated by breath testing in patients with IBS. Is it the exact pattern of SIBO? And, and that we, I don't think we can still fully say. And some of this wraps even further into the controversy of SIBO, which is the, the, the time interval is important. And you can see false positives, meaning the test says you have SIBO, but you actually don't if you're not interpreting in, in the, a narrow enough time window. And this is, this is an accurate criticism, and this is why the, these two bodies that I outlined a moment ago are now endorsing a, a shorter time interval so as to guard against these false positives. We also look at the overall trend does show that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth does seem to be significantly more common in those with IBS. But you can be perfectly healthy and test positive for SIBO. And this is where sometimes people have a hard time with the nuance. If we were to look at 100 people who are normal and 100 people who had IBS, we'd probably see maybe just giving you know, rough approximations about 4% of those healthy subjects have SIBO and about 40% of those healthy subjects, I'm sorry, 40% of the subjects with IBS have SIBO. So you know, if you're looking for a, this test is 100% accurate all the time, then you're not going to find that. But that's not really, that's very um, unfrequently found in, in healthcare. So we do see a trend showing that if you have the symptoms of IBS, you're more likely by a significant margin to have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There's also data, which in my mind is more important and more compelling, showing that when you look at a SIBO breath test and then you treat someone for the SIBO and then you retest, the values tend to trend in a correlating direction that correspond with someone's improvement. So the worse the test results, the worse someone's symptoms, you treat them, the better their symptoms get, the better their results become. In spite of all of that, I still don't recommend serial retesting of SIBO every time someone is treated to retest to guide treatment. I, I think that is an area, I don't know if Christensen essentially made that criticism per se. Um, he, he did, yeah. He, he said there's huge lack of consistency in the, in the results of the hydrogen breath test. Right. And, and I, I don't know if we could say there's huge lack of consistency in the results. I, I do think there's, there's enough consistency to show significant uh, you know, positives in a IBS population compared to a control population. But I, I think one of the comments he made was SIBO testing was overperformed, and I would agree. Uh, and and I, I cite in my review to article that the Rome consensus recommends very conservative testing, the North American consensus recommends somewhat more liberal testing, and, and kind of in the middle of those two was a systematic review published essentially saying that if you have someone with otherwise non-responsive symptoms, consider testing them to identify if SIBO is an issue, and then from there, treat empirically, meaning treat based upon someone's symptomatic response. And that's essentially what I advocate. So it means we can use the testing to partially inform what we're doing, but are we going to hang our hat fully on the testing, be overly literal with how we interpret the testing, and inculcate you into thinking that if you have SIBO, you have some incurable condition and, and shroud this in fear? You know, all those things I would disagree with. And I think those were some of the criticisms that, that Christensen made. You know, and I, I don't like being overly critical, but I, I, I think this is important because he made very strong definitive conclusions. And as I said earlier, be wary of someone who makes strong definitive conclusions because they are oftentimes unaware of the nuance in a body of literature. And so if you wanted to write an article- I'll, and, and I'll, just, I'll just mention one, one thing just to be please. fair. Like he's, not, he's not saying these symptoms don't exist, this cluster of symptoms don't exist. 
the main critique is there's basically lots of evidence pointing to the, in his opinion, um, that contradict the notion that it is specifically small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that's responsible for those symptoms, uh, as opposed to, let's say, just dysbiosis. Um, and, and that the testing for detecting uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is, is effective in accurately differentiating people with these symptoms versus those without. So, but you know, I, I, I will leave it at that. I think ideally I would get you guys both on and you guys could debate back and forth for an hour on this subject. But uh, sure. since we're, we're limited in time here, I think we'll... And let me, let me just paint one more, one more thing. In his article and in his video, he made very absolute statements. And those absolute statements were untenable. There, there is not conclusive data to support his statements. Now, I'd, I would have zero issue if anyone wanted to write an article criticizing something and, and using cautious language. You know, there's, a, there's some unanswered questions here. There are some contradictory data points that we need to explore. Fine, you have, I have no quarrel with that at all. I think that's very healthy. But his language was, was very absolute and very definitive and I think was very misleading. And, and I, you know, I, I'm happy to have a further conversation with him at any point. So yeah, I think also it's worth mentioning on this subject that uh, he has written an article, it's publicly available. You've also written a rebuttal article that is also publicly available. So I would encourage everybody listening to, to read uh, both reviews of the evidence and you can see Dr. Ruscio's uh, you know, respond, direct responses to uh, Alan's, uh, Dr. Christensen's um, statements in the article. So I think it's, it's worth exploring that for people listening. Um, I, and again, ideally, it would be great to have you guys both on for an hour and, uh, and talk back and forth directly. Um, Dr. Ruscio, how much more time do you have? Because I know we, you might have a hard cutoff coming up here. I, I, there's a bunch more topics I want to cover, but I, I, I want to narrow it down if you're real short on time. Uh, I can roll for another 10. Okay, perfect. So we have all these different uh, gut problems that are emerging, gut dysbiosis, permeability, IBS, IBD, SIBO. CFO, uh, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So, you know, in, in keeping with the theme we just transitioned out of, I think I've been one of the more active critics against this overzealous conclusion that, that's kind of, you know, potentiated on the internet that everyone has to avoid gluten. I think that's harmful and I don't think the evidence supports that. And there was recently a study published, a multi-center trial in Italy that looked at 12,225 patients. And this, this was a group of physicians who were really trying to better understand non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And just for the audience, that, that means that you don't have celiac, but you feel essentially that you have a problem with gluten. And they, they devised a 60-point assessment looking at lab markers, subjective findings, objective findings. Um, and they were trying to figure out what signs and symptoms and history and lab markers all kind of correlated into this syndrome of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And they found some, you know, I, they shouldn't really be surprising, but I guess they're surprising relative to the, the, the current ethos that exists regarding gluten sensitivity. And essentially what they found was about 3% of the population was found to be non-celiac gluten sensitive. So, this is both a good and a bad thing, right? If, if, you're, if you're overzealous about gluten-free, then this probably comes off as a bad thing. I would say this is actually a good thing. This gives us some very high-level support that, yes, there are people without celiac who do have a, a, a documentable problem with gluten. Um, and it also hopefully should be reassuring that that's not the majority of the population. So we don't have to be making these blanket statements that because gluten is bad for some, it's bad for all. It's like saying if you have type 2 diabetes, um, you have to be very careful with your blood sugar. But if you have a blood sugar of 103, you, which is you know, very, it's, I would say it's essentially normal, but it's three points over the cutoff. If you have a, if you have a blood sugar of 103, you have to be eating the same way as an end stage type two diabetic. That, that's kind of the conflation that's made. Uh, and that can be harmful for people. Now, there, there's some immediate 
uh, rebukes that come up when I share this, which is the U.S. is going to have a different grain supply than Europe. And I think that's a fair criticism. Now, in the same paper, the authors cite data in the U.S. showing various studies have found an incidence of 0.6 to 6 percent of non-celiac gluten sensitivity in the U.S. And the glyphosate use may contribute to that, essentially a pesticide that's, that's more commonly used here. Uh, so we may have up to double the amount of this in the U.S. that we do Europe. But that's still 6% of the population. And if even that 6% is underreported, we couldn't expect it to be much more than double that. I'm just, just throwing out some, some reasonable inferences here. So even at the, the highest level of extrapolation, maybe we get to 12%. That is still very far away from what feels like a 80, 90% of, of, of recommendation of, of the population to avoid gluten kind of in the, in the current um, integrative healthcare narrative. There's one or two other points, but one I think is, is very salient, which is, you know, oftentimes you get the, the comment that, well, you could be eating gluten and fueling this underlying inflammatory slash autoimmune process that may not manifest symptomatically for weeks or months or years. And, you know, okay, I'm open to this, but we, we have to be looking at the evidence to inform whether or not the hypothesis has any validity or, or not. And in this study, they found that over 90% of people who are non celiac gluten sensitive, so who had a reaction to gluten, noticed that reaction within 24 hours. So what that tells you is that if you're going to do a gluten elimination and reintroduction, you have an over 90% chance, at least according to this study, that if you have a problem with gluten, you will have a symptomatic reaction within 24 hours. Why this is helpful is because if someone is sitting there and saying, well, I'm, I'm not sure I, I have a family history of X, Y, or Z that's autoimmune, and I'm not sure if I should ever have any gluten, it, it appears that when you perform your reintroduction, you have a very high probability that if you're going to negative re negatively react, you will react within 24 hours. And, and so I think that's freeing for people and can help them make a better discernment as to whether or not they need to avoid gluten um, and it can help them live a less encumbered lifestyle. I still have no problem with eating gluten reduced, but there's a difference. You know, the, the, it, it's, a, it's a long road to go from gluten reduced to fully gluten free. And, and, and the psychosocial implications of going 100% gluten free are, are somewhat damaging. They're, they're difficult. And so if we can spare someone from adhering to that who doesn't need to, then I think that's a real win. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we only have a few minutes left. Can you kind of get real practical here and kind of give uh, an overview of what the steps of your approach to healing the gut look like? Um, sure. You know, and, sure. And, yeah, go for it. I'll let you take it from here. So in the book, we essentially go through, all, you know, many of these, these different things, um, you know, carbs and gluten and food allergens and also probiotics and antimicrobial herbs and specialty diets and dysbiosis and prokinetics and fiber and, and what have you. Um, and then at the end, if, if you really understand this stuff, you can, you can portray it into an algorithm, meaning step one, do this. And if you feel great, then you kind of go to this maintenance finishing track. And if you're not feeling great, you can escalate and then go to step two. And if at step two, you feel great, you're kind of done and you can go to your maintenance track. Uh, or if not, you can ask it to step three. And, and so that's essentially what I write into the book. But step one is really diet and lifestyle. And the, the real onboarding point for people to try to figure out what diet is best for them involves uh, one meal frequency. And then some people do better with frequent meals. Other people do better with intermittent fasting. I don't think we can say everyone should do one or the other, but rather we can listen to one system to determine what their ideal meal frequency should be. Um, but probably more unique to just gut health would be, do you want to start your diet in the direction of kind of a paleo diet, which is a essentially an anti-inflammatory diet that reduces common allergens? That's one track you can go down. The other would be, do you need to reduce fermentable substrates in your diet? And this is known as the low FODMAP diet, because for some people, they may have too much bacteria in the small intestine and in the gut generally, or they may have an immune system or pain receptors that are hypersensitive to gases and or bacteria that are fed by high FODMAP foods. Therefore, they may feel better by going on a low FODMAP diet. Uh, there's a couple other nuances, but in terms of you know what is the initial divergent point, it's trying to assess if someone's unique gut does better on a paleo diet or a low FODMAP type diet. And the good news is you only need about two to three weeks 
to discern if one of these is helping you. And if one is, you ride out that wave until you plateau and then reevaluate. And if it's not, then you move on to the other diet. So it's not hard to at least kind of peg the initial diet stroke. After that, you know, there, there's a succession of steps, but one of the next things we recommend people consider is probiotics. And there's confusion regarding probiotics, which is really unfortunate, but uh, just to say this somewhat succinctly, you can take every probiotic product out there and categorize it into one of three types. And category one is a lactobacillus bifidobacterium blend. Category two is essentially a healthy fungus, Saccharomyces boulardii. And category three are your soil-based or spore-forming probiotics, which oftentimes have bacillus, different types of bacillus species in them. And why this is important is because some people do well on one probiotic, some people don't do well on another type of probiotic, and some people do well on all three. And if, let's say you, you take a category one probiotic and you react negatively. But well, you didn't realize it was a category one probiotic, right? It was called, you know, gut, gut saver 10 or whatever, and it has 10 strains. And then, oh, you get bloated. So then you hear about this other one, you know, you see it on TV or whatever, and you try that and it's called, you know, gut restore five. But you don't realize that you keep trying the same category of probiotic, and that's where you're having this repeat negative reaction. Once you come to that realization, you can say, okay, the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strain blends, category one, don't work well for my system. I'm not gonna use them anymore, but I am gonna try a category two and a category three and see which one of those works for me, retain that one, use none of the others, and then kind of keep working through the steps that we lay out in the book. Excellent, I, ha I have one last question for you, which is on, on the subject of kind of getting positive feedback based on interventions or dietary changes that you do, there seems to me to be a one potential big pitfall there, which is sometimes people are highly reactive to, to all kinds of things and end up on increasingly more extreme and restrictive diets that sure. ultimately end up being extremely unhealthy and deficient in lots of different nutrients. Um, and they get there as a result of sort of just listening to their body. How, how can you listen to your body while avoiding that pitfall? Uh, it's, it's a great question, and there have been two studies that have looked at this, and I'll, I'll give you kind of the brief summary. That one study in Italy found that perhaps as much as 30% of people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity actually had another underlying problem in the gut that was manifesting their symptoms. Now, that's just an observation of an association. We then have to prove that you can actually treat that and see an effect. Another study, and there's been a number like this published, looked at um, I believe it was 15 patients who were celiac, went gluten-free, and didn't improve. And essentially, they found that um, two of these patients were intolerant to lactose. One had a roundworm infection. One had blastocystis hominins. And then the other 10 had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and one kind of dropped out, which accounts for the, that last remainder. But the point is, after the subjects were treated for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or the other two infections, they all responded and they all overcame their symptoms. So if diet doesn't work, and I, I directly address this in the book, we don't want to try to force a non-dietary problem, or oh, I'm sorry, we don't want to try to force a dietary solution to a non-dietary problem. So if the diet doesn't get you to a point where you're feeling better and then you can eventually broaden your diet to the broadest diet possible, there's probably something else going on in the gut that needs to be remedied. Because the goal is to not have you on a restrictive diet forever, use those short term to heal and also guide awareness to what a, a couple of your true food intolerances might be. But we should ultimately get you to a point where you're feeling better, you're able to expand your diet, still feeling better, and worst case scenario, you only have a handful of foods that are problematic for you, and, and you can generally eat a much broader diet with a much more resilient gut. It's an excellent point. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruscio, and I appreciate you going a little overtime here with me. Um, I have like 10 more points on my list of, of things I wanted to ask you about, <laughs> but I guess we're not getting to those. So, um, where can people find out more about your work? And obviously they can get your book, Healthy Gut, Healthy You on Amazon. Uh, and where can people find out more about your work and, and follow you? 
Uh, well, as you said, the, the books available on Amazon is Healthy Gut, Healthy You. And then pretty much everything else I do, you can plug in through the website, which is drrusho.com, D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O.com. We have a weekly podcast, a weekly video, a weekly article. And also, if you're a healthcare provider, we publish a monthly newsletter that's subscription access only, where we go through case studies, research summaries, and, and we take all this stuff that we've talked about and we kind of look under the hood from the clinician end, meaning you know, this is what uh, the research is showing, this is how we apply it in the clinic, here is a test not to run, here is a test to run. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, <laughs> that's a lion's share of it. It keeps me pretty busy. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Dr. Ruscio. It was, a, it was a pleasure doing this with you and I hope to do it again. Been great. We'd love to. Thank you. Yeah. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.